You are listening to the Catholic Exchange Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Catholic Exchange Podcast. This is your editor and host, Michael Lichens, here today with a voice that will be very familiar, or at least the name will be familiar. It's her first time on our podcast. I have Miss Susie Andres here today. Susie is a graduate of both I know Thomas Aquinas College, but also the University of Notre Dame. You've written on many subjects, especially on Thomas McGovern, who's one of the great, great scholars. And Susie here is a frequent writer here. Today we're talking about a favorite subject for both of us, the servant of God, Marcel Van. There's so much material to cover. I can't give you all of Marcel Van's life. We'll cover a little bit in this podcast. But I also want to encourage you, all of you, to please go online Either you can go to CatholicExchange.com, we'll have all the links you'll need. You can also go to Susie's website, SusieAndres.com, where you can read a little bit of Miss Marcel's musings. But Marcel Van, a servant of God, was killed uh, in an internment camp in North Vietnam during the Troubles. And in the meantime, he was something of a little brother to St. Therese, and offers a way of holiness in the months I've discovered him that I found very inspiring, and I'm hoping to share that all with you, our listeners. So, Susie, with that long about introduction, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Michael. Uh, So, let's go ahead and get started today. Can you tell me, how did you find the servant of God, Marcel Van, and what brought you to devotion to him? Well, I've had a long devotion to um, St. Therese, and I was reading a booklet about her that Catholic Truth Society had published. Oh, God bless them. I can't remember... Yeah, exactly. It was. It's an English publication. I'm not sure who, or British. I'm not sure who marketed it here um, at the time. But when I, um, I think maybe Ignatius Press. But when I came across this little booklet, "Spiritual Children of Saint Therese," it had a page on Marcel Van. It was a very small booklet, like you might find in the back of mm-hmm. church, and each entry was short. But I was very intrigued by little Marcel. He but there was a picture of an Asian boy and the little recounting that Leonie gave said that he had become the little brother of St. Therese, but in particular it mentioned that he had conversations with her. Mm -hmm. And it might have even mentioned that his spiritual director asked him to write these conversations down, but I immediately thought this would be fabulous to be able to read these conversations that St. Therese had with this Vietnamese boy, because it, I think it indicated that Therese personally taught him her little way. Mm-hmm. And I, I read that about him maybe 10 years ago, a little less, but I didn't have access to any other information about him. And then sometime between then and now, maybe five years ago, I saw, um, I think maybe on the website Mystics of the Church, I saw a blurb about him or a, a longer explanation of him, and it even had some quotations, possibly from his conversations with Therese, but for some reason, the Holy Spirit must have thought that wasn't the right moment for me to meet him, because whereas before, originally 10 years ago, I thought, if only I could get a hold of this, um, five years ago, when I saw the little bit about him, there, there, were no, there was no access to any more information than just that article, but I was very happy to just let that slide. I'm not even sure I read the whole article. I thought, eh, okay, that's neat, but maybe I wasn't. You know, maybe this isn't for me, and maybe at that moment it wasn't, but then just in the fall of 2016, um, one of my favorite ways of finding books is being, <laughs> finding people through books, really, is being in um, a Catholic library <laughs> or a Catholic bookstore, but often a library. Um, my husband works at Thomas Aquinas College, and we are, um, as you mentioned, graduates of there. So I was in that library looking for some material um, that I was using to help in a in a book that I was writing on St. Therese. Mm-hmm. And I found, as I was walking down the stacks, keeping my eyes open, I saw Marcel Van's autobiography. And I remembered the name, and it had a nice clear spine. You know, it just said, autobiography, Marcel Van. But when I pulled it down, <laughs> I didn't have any idea where it was going to lead. I brought it home. Oh, this is that guy. And Maybe I can't remember if I got to it a few days later, and like I, um, <laughs> like I do, I knew that I would, if I started at the beginning, maybe not get very far. So I flipped it open and tried to find out where it was that he met Saint Therese or began his conversations mm-hmm. with her. And sure enough, 
I, I found that passage. It's about two, two-thirds of the way through the book. And when I started reading, I was blown away and super-duper excited about what she was telling him. That led to my realizing through this book that this was only one of four volumes of Marcel's writings and that, in fact, there was a whole book dedicated to these conversations, not just with Therese, but also with Jesus and Mary. Mm. So I, I ordered that book. Um, since then, a year and a half, in this time, it's become more readily accessible because there's a group in France that promotes Marcel's cause. They're called Les Amis de Van. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have gotten all of his books just maybe in the last two months. They've gotten all four volumes of his books in English wow. onto Amazon for the United States or, you know, English speaking people. It's magnificent. They're, they're, um, they're very affordable. They've gotten the price down to $25 and free shipping. But when I was looking just a year and a half ago, I ordered for like nearly $40 a copy um, that had to come to me from far away, apparently, because it seemed to take forever. You know, you get so used to instant yeah. gratification. But um, it, <laughs> the book came into my mailbox. I mentioned I was working on a book on St. Therese. It came into my bell- mailbox the day that I finished the manuscript I was working on, and I had said a little prayer to St. Therese, hey, why don't you send me a rose in my mailbox to mm-hmm. let me know that you're good with what I've written about you. And sure enough, there was Marcel. And then... I think that he and Therese played a little trick on me because once I started reading that book, and it's just been my constant companion since then, I can't get enough of it, um, I discovered that I was much more interested in Marcel's conversations with Jesus than with his conversations with Therese, which seemed appropriate enough. Yeah, no, absolutely. (laughs) But um, yeah, basically that, that is how I came to know him, and especially through that book, Conversations, um, I was then really desirous of getting the book of his letters, his correspondence, and I could see pictures of it on the internet, and it had been translated into English. But like I say, his books were very hard to find. I was having a lot of trouble. And I ended up accidentally getting into correspondence with Jack Keegan, who's the British gentleman who's translated um, these writings of Marcel and it just blows my mind because what happened, Jack is the kindest man in the world. And what happened was he also, um, maybe 20 years ago, because he loved St. Therese, he saw a connection in an article he was reading mm-hmm. about there's this Marcel van and he called a number that was available to him to raise a meet van in France and asked, can I get an English copy of his autobiography? And they told him, we don't have one. We we would love to have his books translated into English. But he wrote in Vietnamese. The books were translated by his spiritual director into French. That took his spiritual director 20 years to do oh that. Oh, my to goodness. Satisfaction. Those only became, Marcel died in 1959. Mm-hmm. Those books became available in maybe 1985. And then I'd say closer to the year 2000, um, Jack, <laughs> Marcel has this way with all of us, and Jack in speaking and just requesting this book and finding out that it wasn't available, and, and they said, you know, unfortunately, we don't have the money to you know, hire a translator. I'm, not, I'm, I'm guessing that's what they said. Mm-hmm. He surprised himself by spontaneously offering to translate that oh book, my gosh. which led to his own you know, nearly 20 years, maybe 15, working on this project one book after another because he too fell in love with Marcel and um, wanted them available. So what's beautiful to me is that here is this this saint who has a process um, for a cause for canonization going, and he's fairly close to our time, but far enough back, he died before 1960, that we might think in all those years, oh, how did I not hear about him sometime since then? I mean, (laughs) some of us maybe weren't born, but the idea being the saints were so used to having access to everything, and it's stunning to me to realize that um, I feel like my my learning about him and loving him has been very timely, because even, you know, even 10 years ago when I first read about him, I wouldn't 
have had access to his writings, whereas now... Heck, I remember asking you a year ago where we could find these books, and you gave me some helpful websites, but there wasn't much to go on. So that's very no, impressive. Exactly. Yeah, no, and, and so they're, they're really available now. Two DVDs about him have also recently put up on Amazon um, for the United States, and um, everything is is right there as if, as if it's always been there. It's so wonderful. I, I think when I was first reading conversations then only a year and a half ago, and then I got in touch with Jack Keegan to find the, com- the, mm-hmm. look up the correspondence of his letter. That's volume three. Um, so it's first his autobiography, second, his conversations, third, his letters. And then there was a fourth volume that came out after you know, I started getting curious about him just a year ago. So it's it's only now that these things are hitting um, English-speaking audiences, at least. I I have heard from a friend that Marcel is much more known in France. And I've also heard from another friend that he's known in Vietnam. Wow. So it's an exciting time for us. <laughs> yes. I love that, you know, we're so used to, like, being first in everything. <laughs> like, no, <joy. laughs> it takes it, it can take it's a little fun. while sometimes for the good news to filter up. Like what you were saying about this idea of falling in love with Marcel, I think that's how a lot of people do it, and it almost seems as if Marcel finds his way to the people who need him in some ways, whether it's a kindly priest who can take 20 years to translate or just everyday yes, laity. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I think that... <laughs> this is going to sound goofy. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I entertain myself by thinking... <laughs> It's not that I spend a lot of time thinking about this, but something will pop in my head. I'll say, that's what I want written on my tomb. You know? <laughs> this is what I want <laughs> to say. So, you know, I have thought, <laughs> I believe in the communion of saints. That would be a great thing for a gravestone. And I yes, I do so love the saints. And what I have noticed is that I'm sure any saint that you chose and wanted to become friends with would be very happy to accommodate you. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I feel like there are certain saints that love, 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 not just to be friends from a distance, but to come very close. And Therese had said to her sisters when she was going to die, and they were all really sad, but they were writing down everything she said. She said some amazing things about the kind of friendship she would have with them after she died. And one of the things she said was, I will come down. And then there are magnificent stories. I wish I knew French. Um, volumes and volumes of stories in the archives of Ms. Du Carmel, where they wrote down, uh, they received and, and, and compiled all of these testimonies of different people who would say things like, I was reading this story of a soul, you know, it was right, it was right after she died. This was before there was a process, before there was much thought, mm-hmm. but they had printed story of a soul and sent it out 2000 copies and then ran out of those quickly. And then people started requesting them once the first set were out. She's, she's really great at, um, publicity or something, self-promotion, that's the word. So, so they were getting all these letters and you can read some of them in old books on St. Therese and, and the letters will say things like, I read the story of a soul by Sister Therese of your Carmel. And while I was reading it, I realized I could ask her. She really cared, and I could ask her, and then they'll mention some favor. And so as I continued reading, I started smelling these flowers. Well, we've heard of that kind of thing. But then yes. they might say, I heard a voice. <laughs> you heard a voice. <laughs> holy moly. You know? And and she just delighted in making herself, and still does, very, very present. Um, there's a book now that's available by an author. I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but Elizabeth Ficocelli. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, and it's called Shower of Roses, and it's just contemporary stories about people having experiences like this. I have never... <laughs> never heard a voice. Uh, I always laugh because I think then I'd have to really get serious and have a spiritual yeah. director who could discern what, where's the voice coming from. So I'm fine without that. But but what I have found is that the more that we talk to these saints, the more that they are just thrilled, you know, to talk back in their own quiet ways. Like 
her as sending me Marcel on the day when I asked her to send me a sign. Some people, of course, there's the roses with St. Therese, mm-hmm. but, um, but there's, there, and I don't want to minimize that, but I, I love her roses and I, I love that because yes. I guess my point is the saints want to be close to us. And again, some in particular, Padre Pio is another one, but Marcel falls to this class where he doesn't, he doesn't stay away. And, and as you, I mean, I think that these saints choose us too. They, they're keeping an eye out and they know when we need them and then they enter our lives. And, um, and it's a gift that is beyond anything. I mean, if you think about how much friendship means to us and true love and, and romance and all the things that Chesterton did such a great job celebrating and enjoying. Yes, he did. All those, all those things, you know, I think are most epitomized in the in the saints and their friendship with us. I agree. And you describe uh, Marcel Van as, as a sort of shortcut to Teresa's little way. And actually, one of your articles is called A Little Way for Dummies. But can you describe how is he pathway to St. Teresa in the little way of holiness? Yes, definitely. I I think that I've been, I've been thinking about this for a while and trying to figure it out. But I think that the essential part of St. Therese's message to her and the most revolutionary thing about her and the reason that she gained such worldwide fame so quickly was that she wants to show us that it's precisely in our weakness and littleness and powerlessness that God loves us. We don't have to be something else. He loves us just as we are. and the the more pathetic we are, the more attraction we have for him in a certain way, because, you know, whereas in the world, we're used to seeing people we really admire, um, mm-hmm. fictional characters, Jason Bourne, now that's a guy, right? <laughs> but it's not about being <clears throat> strong and powerful. I mean, we, we admire these people, but we also tend to feel like, well, obviously, um, and, and that's fictional, but I mean, take a real life hero, we tend to think, I'm nowhere near that caliber of person. I couldn't achieve those yes. great heights. Well, Therese wanted over and over again to teach everyone, starting with the novices. She was made an official novice mistress in her convent. Mm-hmm. And she started there and letters she wrote, just this new little way, which was in fact very old. It's exactly what St. Paul says when he talks in Corinthians about wanting God to take away um, his weakness but realizing that that was where god god let him know that's where my power rests in you so this Mm -hmm. is therese is saying if you are little then god will take care of everything be that little child abandoning yourself into god's arms and that was very effective in her own lifetime because here she was she died when she was 24 she could convincingly sell this to her sisters in the convent because they saw her failures up close and personal. She was, I was just telling my son this morning, (laughs) she had never done any chores at home when she was Mm -hmm. a little girl. And so when she went to the convent and was assigned the task of sweeping, she was terrible at it. She was definitely (laughs) afraid of spiders. And, you know, she had all these little foibles and, and her sisters would see that they would see her break down weeping. They would see her sleeping during her prayer times. And, and I mean her sisters in the convent and her own blood sisters who were in the convent as well. But at this point and from this distance, we see that almost any church in the world you go into, there's a statue of St. Therese. And we know that if you call on her, she'll answer you. And we feel, I think rightly, that she's on Jesus's lap and she's one of the greatest saints. Um, St. Pius, um, he, the Pope who gave us daily communion and communion at the age of seven a hundred years ago, I guess more than a hundred years ago now, but he called her before she was canonized. He called her the greatest saint of modern times. So when we think of her in the terms of the greatest saint of modern times, and, and if you've ever said a novena to her and found yourself, you know, roses coming at you, you think, oh yeah, she's a great saint. And then the problem with that is that it um, tends to undercut the message. I said I don't want her to change anything about that. So that Saint Therese, keep coming, keep sending your roses. But, but the problem with that is then she looks big to us. Mm-hmm. She's got this beautiful basilica. I've never been to 
to this part of France, and I hope someday to go, but she's got this beautiful basilica with this huge statue of her in front of it and this gorgeous kind of sarcophagus tomb inside her, uh, you know, where it's got this beautiful replica of her Mm -hmm. in death. All these things make us think, yeah, yeah, I love her message, but she's obviously big. Enter Marcel. He is so little. He also died when he was only um, 31, so young. Oh, my goodness. But he had, like Therese, he, his intellect awoke very early. So on the one hand, he's constantly forgetting what Jesus just told him. But on the other hand, he was able to write his autobiography when his spiritual director asked him. He wrote it four or five times, which is amazing, <laughs> because this is no St. Augustine or St. Thomas Aquinas. This is a little boy who's about 16, 17, 18 and trying to remember and write down he can about what has so far been a very short life. And he does. He writes these things down, these full memories, very poetic. And everything that happened to him, he, he recalls, which I'm sure was the Holy Spirit acting to give us this gift. But in telling us his story, you see a very small person. Yes. Um, he physically was also very small. But in the conversations in particular, Jesus said to him, Marcel, you're going to be one of my chosen apostles. I have many little secretaries, and I want you to be one. I want you to write down everything I say to you, but I also want you to write down everything you say to me, because I want those who read this later after you die, I want them to see the kind of intimate conversations we are, that we have, and I want them to understand that I'm not just there for people who are already Mm -hmm. perfect, you know, in all your crosses and struggles. So Marcel did what Jesus said, and the result is absolutely hilarious. Yeah. (laughs) Jesus, you know, the conversations, this is how the conversations go. Jesus will say something so beautiful and deep and theologically true. I've been blessed with a ridiculously great education. Um, I got my master's degree in philosophy and Heaven knows why. I never wanted to teach. I'm a terrible teacher. But it turns out it's so that when I came across Jesus speaking to Marcel, I would have enough background to be able to recognize his voice and say, there is no question. This is completely theologically sound. I mean, you don't need a great education because each of the four volumes in Mm -hmm of his collected works have an introduction and the sanction of the church through a cardinal or one of them is an archbishop. And the first postulator of his cause, Cardinal Van Swan, himself a Vietnamese, now is venerable. So, you know, he's got the signs of holiness all about him. But when I read what Jesus said, when when you read that, you hear such beautiful revelations of love, just like out of the things Jesus said to any of the mystical saints. And then Marcel's response. And I'm, you know, I'm always hanging on Jesus's words and then I'm ready. Marcel, oh, you know, are, are you, I mean, <laughs> I feel like the saints say we should meditate on Christ's passion every day. And I try to say my rosary and, you know, I can really relate to St. Teresa of Avila saying, what a hard heart I have. You know, can I squeeze out a tear for you, Jesus? I mean, St. Mm-hmm. Teresa of Avila did. <laughs> I, I have trouble. But when I read these words of Jesus to Marcel, I'm, I'm swooning. And then, And then Marcel's response, yeah, Jesus, my soutane is too tight. Listen, aren't we going to get me a bigger one? (laughs) Or, Jesus, I'm hungry. Or, yeah, Jesus, I forgot everything you told me yesterday. Could you say it over again? Because I need to write it down. (laughs) I love it. I think, actually, I might be swooning with love for the second while I'm reading a book, because I love books. But, you know, in my holy hour, Mm -hmm. (laughs) trying not to spend too much time on the grocery list. Sure. Jesus, I know you're right here in front of me, but I need to go to the grocery store. And he is so like us in that way. So he is tiny and ridiculous and funny. He's mm-hmm. human and down to earth and weak. He's forgetful. He's he's worried about the kinds of things we are where someone says something to him and he comes back to Jesus and says, does brother so-and-so hate me? Or oh, man. <laughs> I was trying to tease this other guy. And he got mad at me, and every time I try and make a joke, he thinks I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Jesus, but, you know, what's, and, and then Jesus has these great answers, like, 
Marcel, it's not your business. <laughs> it's not my favorites. But at the same time, explaining, you know, don't worry. You're fine. He's fine. What your job is is just to try to be kind but to pay attention to me. And don't let all this stuff get to you. I, it's convincing. It's it's convincing mm-hmm. and it's reading a little who lived it from a place of kind of our own poverty. That's that's basically what I'll say. So I think he's this little way for dummies, a little way that St. Therese gave us, but then taught him personally in which he lived in order mm-hmm. to remind the world that this message is for all of us. And it's almost as if you want to trust your teacher. You have to trust your teacher or you can't learn. And if you were going to go become a neurosurgeon, you'd want to study with the best doctors in the world who knew what they were doing and mm-hmm. knew how to practice what they preached. So similar you're learning the little way, I think there's nowhere you can learn it from than someone little. And that would be that would be Marcel. And I think that's a great summation of just all the wonderful ways that um, Marcel can help we are, to grow in holiness, which is a universal call. Oh, we at Catholic Exchange say we want to make saints in our lifetime, which sometimes I get an email like, really? Is that really a little presumptuous? I was like, I'm hoping not, but we shall see. Yeah, I, yeah, I was just reading in his, I, I always turn to the book Conversations. That's the one I'm most fond of. That's mm-hmm. the one I most highly recommend. But his autobiography is amazing. And just today, I was, um, I've been writing at my blog a kind of novena of posts for nine days. And I, I thought, you know, it's time to bring in autobiography. And I opened to when he first met Therese. And this story is oh. exactly what you're saying. I think that, I mean, that's wonderful to hear. I, I love Catholic Exchange and, and also the work of Sophia Institute Press precisely because of this realization of the call to sanctity and this mission to try to bring that to everyone. Well, in some ways, I think that we take that for granted. So it's, it's fun and funny to yes. hear someone saying, really? But but it's true because we, we do all, on the one hand, even if we're familiar with it, it's hard to figure out how that works in our day-to-day life, especially when we're not, most of us, we're not priests and nuns. But I would say um, mm-hmm. Marcel struggled with that, and that's what brought him and brought him and Therese together. He he talks in his autobiography. At a certain point, he interrupts the flow of the story to say, Father, writing to his spiritual director, Father Boucher, I want to tell you what happened at this point. I had I had wanted I wanted so badly to become a saint, but I felt that that was presumptuous. And what he what he juxtaposes so beautifully is this tension in him. He didn't have Vatican II to bring out the universal call to holiness. He didn't yet know St. Therese mm-hmm. who showed us the little way. So he was thinking, saints are people who do great deeds for God. They endure great penances. And he himself had had a lot of suffering, but he felt no attraction to voluntarily take on more, <laughs> which I can really relate to as well. So he was saying, on the one hand, I feel, I felt, this desire to be a saint. But on the other hand, I thought I must be very presumptuous. And I wondered if this was a sin because he thought it was a sin against humility. It was a kind of pride. So he's oh my goodness. on a very particular evening in October of 1942. He was 14. He's in the minor seminary. He's finally found a good one and he's praying in the chapel and he's tortured by this tension. This particular night, he just doesn't know what to do. So he goes over to the statue of Our Lady of Grace, the image that we see on the Miraculous Medal. He goes to a statue of Our Lady and says, Blessed Mother, I'm putting this problem into your hands. Please give me a sign and show me if these are if these thoughts of wanting to be a saint are from the devil or from God and what I can do about it. Show me if there's a way. Mm-hmm. He went out of the chapel into study hall and he had finished his homework. So he decided to pick up a book um, a saint's life. And as he went over and looked at the books available to him, he was discouraged and, and kind of annoyed because he, he wanted a book with a lot of pictures. <laughs> Who wouldn't? And he had read sure. with the pictures and the other ones looked boring. And he said, no, I'll tell you what. He's kind of talking to himself, kind of talking to our lady. He shuffles the book 
looks around, closes his eyes. Um, I just just read this this morning and it was so cute. Makes three gestures with his hands, kind of like a hocus pocus abracadabra. He says to our lady, whichever one you pick, I'll read. And he pulls out a book, which to his really intense disappointment is Story of a Soul. No pictures. Oh, my goodness. And he says, oh, you little Therese, whoever you are, I know all about you. You're like all the other saints. You were born under prodigious signs. You lived a long life of miracles and severe penances. When you (laughs) died at the age of 80, you know, he makes up all this stuff. (laughs) And then he feels feels a little, if not guilty, he feels a little, um, like, okay, wait, I just told you, Blessed Mother, that I would read whatever book you picked. So he goes over and sits down with the book. And really, Mm -hmm. there was nothing else to do. Everyone else was studying. So he's, you know, kind of like us in that that way, too. No good distractions. I know the feeling, yeah. So, yeah, so he sits down with the book, and he opens it, and he starts to read. And he is captured. He, He can't, he starts weeping, because in the first pages of Story of a Soul, St. Therese asks God the question, why are there, (laughs) this is terrible, I can't even remember how she asks it, but she asks about how it is that God comes to people, the greatest saints and the littlest ones. And she ends up talking about how his love is like the sunshine and the rain reaching and nourishing the largest cedar Mm -hmm. and the smallest little flower. And in those first few pages of Story of a Soul, which are so beautiful, Marcel found the very answer to the question that had been torturing him immediately. So, you know, that aside, he then, like I'm sure many of us have done, raced through the pages of a book that, you know, had his name written all over it. And just as as I've fallen in love with him, as so many do, he fell in love with Therese. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really neat because it was that exact question of littleness and that exact question of how can we possibly be a saint that that fascinated him. But then his relationship became so much more personal because he felt as if the pages that he was reading were exactly a mirror of his own life. Now, the first time I read that, I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. They grew up in very different yeah. milieus. And, but it turns out the more you find out about Marcel, the more there are these parallels. For instance... He had a grace of conversion on Christmas Eve where he had a real mm-hmm. insight into God's love and what his mission was supposed to be. And that's similar exactly to St. Therese having what she called the grace of her conversion on Christmas Eve um, some decades before. So, uh, for instance, when he had read that, you know, he would have said, wait a minute. But, you know, it's, so, so he saw those particulars, but I think more than that, he felt that in her description of her childhood especially, he was really charmed because he saw that this was not a saint who grew up amidst the kind of visible miracles that we can read about in the lives of the saints that are that are beautiful and inspiring, mm-hmm. but that seem so far from us. Oh, yeah. This was not a saint who practiced severe mortifications. Um, Therese, they wanted to take care of her. She's dying, and she was never very strong in her health. So they gave her a foot warmer, whatever that was, you know? And she, she, she said, I'm going to be trying to go to heaven and the other saints are going to be standing there with their instruments of penance. I'm going to be in line. I'm going to be holding my foot warm. <laughs> so he recognized in her a soul that was one made, you know, made for him to relate to. And then, and then he goes on, um, mm-hmm. maybe a few weeks later, he asked her to be his big sister and felt himself filled with joy that made him know she had said yes. That's the kind of thing that, you know, I'm ready for. I've experienced in, in my own small measure. But then, yes. but then the next step, <laughs> the one where you need a good spiritual director, he went out to sing and rejoice and dance around this mountain by himself where no one could see him. Just he was so happy he couldn't gain oh. it. And then, <laughs> and then, I mean, I could see myself doing that. But then the voice, you know, then the voice, Marcel, my little brother, <laughs> and thus began their conversations. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And then she really started speaking that's, to him. So, um, so. Yeah. Exactly. And that's a one way to get an introduction to St. Therese. Yes. And what I, I guess what I would want to say from that, that we can take away is that 
you know, when I was little, I read a story of St. Anthony of Padua. I love him so much. And I, mm-hmm. I read about the Christ child coming alive on the statue and speaking to him or jumping into his arms. And I used to go to church and we had a really pretty statue of our lady that was with Jesus in her arms, you know, and I was, okay, Jesus, I'm ready. I'm ready. And it was, it was only much later that, um, I became a third order Carmelite and read enough of St. John of the Cross to know, okay, no, you're not, you're not, you don't really want to ask. <laughs> Do they bring their own troubles? But, um, what was so charming with Marcel and Therese and when she started speaking to him was that what she told him first was, yes, I'm going to be your sister, which he had asked. But she said, mm-hmm. I've always been your sister and I've been waiting so long for this moment so that we could become friends so that I could introduce myself because it was all in the mind of God from eternity. But then almost you got the impression that since she entered heaven and had access to God's mind in a more clear and visible beatific vision kind of way, she had been excited about him for, she died in 1897 and it was now 1942. Mm -hmm. So those intervening decades. And then after he was born, she's saying, I was there, but I was waiting for the right moment. And I like to think that that's true for the different saints that we meet and for Marcel now, with mm-hmm. that, you know, he's been waiting for whichever individual soul is listening and here's something that piques their interest or draws them in. Or I, I have one friend, this is the most wonderful thing in the world. She, I think I had told her just a tiny bit about Marcel and she mm-hmm. was captivated and she couldn't remember his name, but she knew this was the little brother of St. Therese. So she started praying to him and, and just kind of feeling his nearness. And I went one day to the drugstore in my town because I wanted to make a few little home holy cards and I um, picked yeah. up a few pictures of Marcel and um, I walked out of the store and here was my friend and I just felt inspired to give her one of these pictures and I had made this really goofy little, you know, you could make like a Christmas card or a Valentine's card and while I was making those cards, I just had some fun and made this little Marcel loves you card, which I just made a couple of. I wanted to send one to Jack Keegan um, and I wanted to keep one. <laughs> and when I saw my friend, I just, it's this kind of interior voice that's the more imaginary kind, you know, just the Holy Spirit whispering, give one to her. And I gave it to her. I said, I, I just have something I want to give you. And it was so great. She looked at it and said, I love him. And then she said, who is he? Oh. <laughs> and was, she, she didn't know who he was. She knew that that it was the little brother of St. Therese, but she couldn't remember his name. She had forgotten everything else about him, you know? <laughs> but that's, that's my soul for you. I mean, he, he will enter your heart and yeah, he, that's... <laughs> he wants to be right. Like- oh, it, it happens that way. And, I like to tell people I basically discovered St. Francis of Assisi simply because he was quoted one time. And even as a tiny, I wasn't tiny. I was a teen and yeah. one already a monster size, but, uh, <laughs> A young teenager yeah. uh, discovered St. Francis. That started a pathway to a friendship I didn't know where it would take me. Yeah. You never really do know yeah. where these friendships will take you. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And by the way, I had a similar encounter with Therese. I actively avoided her when I became Catholic because I, I just that. looked at St. Therese and I said, Yeah, well, great. She was sinless. Good for her. <laughs> I, a convert. I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it took me years before, I think it was actually Flannery, yes, it was in fact Flannery O'Connor. I read that Flannery O'Connor had such great devotion to her, and so did Dorothy Day, two women I have great appreciation for. Oh, that's awesome. And when I read Dorothy Day's biography of St. Teresa, I went, oh my goodness, I'm in love with St. Teresa now too. I want her to be my big sister. Yeah. Did not see that coming. Yeah, yeah. So. And, and that, you know, I wonder, um... I wonder how that works because I, I know exactly what you mean. When I was a child mm-hmm. walking into our church, which was not a particularly beautiful church. It was kind of box like rectangular. Yeah. Um, sure. It's very plain, um, but they did have a few really lovely statues and, and um, a beautiful tabernacle and Jesus was there. So that was great. Walking in the back, um, there was just the tiniest little, almost like a little hallway you'd walk into, into the church proper. It wasn't a hallway. It was like mm-hmm. a foyer, but it was not even worthy of the name. I mean, it was just a couple feet wide and you'd just walk two steps in. It was this little, you know, four by four room almost that you passed through. Mm-hmm. On one side, 
was a statue of the infant of Prague, and I, I had this vague idea, who is that boy dressed so strangely? And on the other side, <laughs> you know, just to your left, and then just to your right, there was a statue of St. Trez, and I thought, yes. I don't like her. You know? <laughs> I don't like her. I don't know who she is, but I don't like her. I, I never really consciously thought those things, but much, much later, you know, I realized, gosh, I wonder why I never saw a statue of the infant of Prague or of St. Trez. <laughs> You, you pass them every day and despise them. This is the, re- the revenge they're taking on you. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think a lot of people have that, and there might be a temptation with Marcel Van because whatever public receptions can be, but what I often say is it's surprising how compassionate the saints are towards your failings and your missteps while you're trying to grow in holiness because they have the same exact ones. They're not any better or more special than you other than the grace that god gives them but that's it otherwise they had the same problems they had to still overcome the same issues yeah you know it's funny because um marcel says after after he had his first critical thought about what this book was he writes in his autobiography Mm -hmm. i've got it here he said oh my dear sister you must necessarily be a saint of heroic courage to put up with the erroneous judgments that I have held on your life. <laughs> <laughs> I think we could all say that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but 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 I do love that idea that, as you said, they they experience those things themselves. So here's Marcel experiencing that, and so I love him. But um, yes, Therese, when she was writing to one of her first spiritual brothers, was um, when I was first excited about Marcel and mentioning him to people. A few people would say. Oh, I, I know who that is because <clears throat> the name sounded like Maurice, um, one of her spiritual priest brothers that she mm-hmm. was assigned to write letters to in her life. Two of them. One of them was Maurice Bellier, and he and she had this beautiful conversation that um, Bishop Patrick Ahern of New York, who's now mm-hmm. now a saint too, but when he was um, just living in New York and loving St. Therese, I've heard that he learned French at the age of 70 in order to read her in the oh original. So I have hope. <laughs> I keep waiting for it to be divinely infused. But anyway, <laughs> I'd have to study. He, um, he wrote a book that, where he translated and put together just the letters of Maurice and Therese. So you can get, in fact, mm-hmm. oh my goodness, your listeners should know if they go to the Institute of Carmelite Studies, ICS yeah. website, um, there's a summer sale going on now that they have every year, but they choose different things. And one of the beautiful things they can get this year for just $10, you can get both huge fat volumes of Therese's correspondence, all the letters St. Therese wrote and letters to her um, during her life. So these letters between her and her priest brother would be in there. But Bishop Ahern made a separate volume that he published that he got a great, like maybe Random House published it or something in New York um, called Story of a Love. And in these letters, there's just about my favorite thing ever that Therese said, precisely on this topic of our relationship with the saints. Maurice was worried that after she went to heaven, because he, they knew she was dying, she wouldn't really be his friend anymore because she would know all about him. <laughs> Any of us have ever yeah. had that worry. <laughs> oh, my. I think I really see me. But she said, she said, you know, she wrote to him and said in this letter, we have a really different idea of the saints because she said, what? What's true is that when I get to heaven, when the saints are in heaven, the blessed in heaven, she said, they have just gone through what we did. They just had all mm-hmm. these same trials and tribulations and temptations and made it to the other side. So they're incredibly interested in you and precisely merciful to all those faults of yours that are making you scrupulous yes. or fear God's justice or things like that. And she said, they love us even more. And and um, want to help us even more than they did when they were on earth because now they're, you know, seeing it all with this clarity and the struggles we have. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I think that uh, it's absolutely the case (laughs) that they're patient with us. (laughs) How many times have I forgotten St. Anthony, you know, months at a time and suddenly my credit card is lost. (laughs) Who do I turn to and who always helps and how many times has Jude, St. Jude heard from, oh, well, maybe this is just me, but I have a feeling it's not. But St. Jude definitely heard from many people who are trying to yeah. study at the last minute going, hey, you say you do impossible causes. Oh, right. well, I got one right. for you. Right, right. And, and, you know, I get a kick out of it because 
whether it's St. Jude and, and then St. Rita with the impossible or mm-hmm. another one for studying is St. Joseph of Cupertino. He was, yes. he, he was apparently so dumb that, but, but he did know, I mean, obviously he had a certain infused knowledge and the one scripture yes. passage he knew was the one that the bishop asked him when they were being, having their oral exam as a group to go on to the priesthood. And he answered so beautifully because the bishop asked him the one verse that he was, just brilliant at answering and um from the new testament the bishop said oh obviously you're all really you're all really well educated i'm going to let everyone go just on your answer so you pray to him to know to be asked the things you know (laughs) on the test and and saint anthony (laughs) with finding things you think to yourself at some point it it might cross your mind is this either superstitious or kind of strange or am i taking advantage Mm -hmm. of the goodwill of the saints to just use them in this way and the answer is absolutely not. They want to be used. I mean, they want us to come to them, and if that's what it takes, no big deal. You know, again, they were here. They get it. Um, <laughs> anything that turns yes. us to God is good. <laughs> oh, a- absolutely, and it's always impressive to me. I think a lot of people might know this if you're a music history fan, but Edith Piaf, of all people, had a great devotion to St. Therese. Not what you would call an ideal or best example catholic by any stretch of the imagination but i think that's just it though we can look at that rather than judgment judging or anything just say well yeah yeah, even the saints no matter who you are they do take an interest in you yeah and that's a very great comfort to realize because not any of us are where we should be but yeah with the saints we can get a little further along yes i i yes i live in a town that is predominantly hispanic in southern california Mm -hmm. and I know I've heard people say, oh, the Mexicans in particular can be superstitious about Our Lady of Guadalupe. I have not found that at all. I can't tell you how edifying it is to see the devotion, which, you know, possibly yes. a person might be living a bad life, but you know that if they're clinging to the knowledge that Our Lady is their mother and that she's there for them, She's going to pull them out of that. And um, Mm -hmm. I think that we can forget or downplay the role that these devotional sacramentals can have in our life, like rosaries or Mm -hmm. statues. Um, And certainly we can get attached to them. (laughs) A friend of mine had this fabulous story about them. She used to, a good, a good, sweet, very loving friend in Virginia, when we used to live there, when we were leaving, she gave us a first class relic of St. Therese. And then when I was living out here in California, I had a friend who loved St. Therese and was going through a rough time. And I said, Hey, would it help you to have St. Therese with you in this little relic? And so I lent the relic to her and she loved that relic and would take it everywhere with her. And um, over time, Therese and God and the angels and the saints brought her out of the difficult times into really glorious marriage and she's just had her first child and all these beautiful things. So the thing is back with me, but, but when my friend laughed about one day, she was saw something on the internet about St. Gemma Galgani and Mm -hmm. how Jesus was talking to St. Gemma and said, I want you to be detached from everything. And St. Gemma said, Jesus, I am, you know, I am. And he said, there's one more thing. And she said, no, no, I've given up everything for you. And he said, no, there's one more thing. And all of a sudden she said, not the tooth. She she had a relic from the passionist. That was her order who later became St. Gabriel Pesanti. And she had a relic that was his oh my tooth. Goodness. <laughs> she loves that relic. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Jesus is saying, don't be too attached even to that. And my friend said, do you think he's sending me a message? <laughs> no, 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 no. We need all the reminders we can get. <laughs> We're so easily distracted. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. We need, we all need help along the way in many ways. Yes, yes. Uh, this is a question I love asking authors. I usually ask people this right after they've written a book. You haven't, qu- I know we haven't quite write, gotten a book from you about Marcel. Maybe someday, but in the research and everything writing you've been doing on him, what has been the most delightful or unexpectedly surprising thing you've learned about him or the spiritual life? Well, you know, I would say the nearness of the saints, but we've already been talking about that. So I'm yes. going to think of something else because I find certain themes in his writings and 
I think the one that might be consoling me the most right now is about his forgetfulness. Um, yes. My my mom has Alzheimer's, and, well, I'm not sure it's absolutely defined that that's what it is, but she's been having a lot of difficulties with her memories, and it's progressing. Uh, not her memories, sorry, her memory. And it's it's progressing. But what is a constant inspiration to me is that she remains incredibly cheerful. She's the, just the best attitude and says, um, oh, yeah, I, I said, you seem happier, though, than you've ever been. And she says, oh, I am. She said, if anything bothers me, I just forget about it. And she starts laughing, you know, because she actually does forget that it happened. And, I, you know, this has been so this has been present to me personally in that way. But besides that, I have um, the worst memory in the world. So I'm wondering what's going to happen when I get Alzheimer's. <laughs> it's going to be really bad. But I have I can relate. Uh, such a bad memory. And yeah, we all experience that at times. I mean, not all of us. Some some have amazing memories. But, but some of us, mm-hmm. we're in this camp of bad memories. And um, my husband teaches now at Thomas Aquinas College. And previously, he taught at Christendom College, both mm-hmm. magnificent college. We're just surrounded by the saints at both of these places. Um, Tim O'Donnell over at Christendom and Mike McLean as president over here and the past president, yes. Warren Carroll, who founded with other people, Christendom and Dr. Ron MacArthur and the other founders here, Tom Dillon. We, we just have been surrounded by the saints at these places. And the students are just, I, I don't even know what to say. I, we love them so much. It's so edifying as the world is, seems like it's throwing itself into the mouth of death. Mm-hmm. Um, you have so much inspiration. Um, I think we, you went to Thomas More College. Um, that's another great yep. school. You know, I don't even want to leave anyone out. Wyoming, uh, Belmont Abbey. You know, there's Ave, there's Franciscan. You know, you don't want to you don't want to leave anyone out. It's like a list of acknowledgments. No, these sure. schools. Well, well. So the blessing is we get to interact and meet my husband much more than myself. But you know, we'll have students over for dinner. We get to meet and get to know. Mm-hmm. A lot of these students, um, this year in California, we had a fire, uh, and all fires. So there was an evacuation there. We didn't happen to have people I with us then. That. We had to leave. But then there was a flood, and, or, or rather there were, there were rains that were threatening mudslides. We were all safe in this area, but they evacuated the school just to, you know, be on the safe side in case they lost power and they didn't yeah. want parents to do all this again. So. We had a group of students come to our house, and again, I just can't say enough about how much we love these students. But there am I, wandering around the campus and running into students that I have met multiple times that I've had over to my house that I've, you know, hosted for dinner, that I've spoken to at length about their... And I I feel like I'm just a zombie. I walk around, I, I, I have no idea who they are. You know, <laughs> I can't remember a name for the life of me. <laughs> All of which is to say... There is Marcel, and he doesn't have my excuse. My husband, uh, God bless him, he's been teaching now. I don't think we're old at all, but he's been teaching for, I think, 25 years now in colleges. Mm -hmm. So we've had this blessing of all these faces and names and stories coming before us, families, siblings. Um, Marcel didn't have that excuse. He was really young, (laughs) but... But he, too, forgot all kinds of stuff. And finally, you know, I've learned that a smile from the heart does a tremendous amount when I say to some dear student, tell me, have we met before? You know, and she has to say, yes, we're best friends. But um, (laughs) I think that similarly what Marcel has taught, I mean, you know, what must grieve us and worry us more is how many times we need to learn these lessons in the spiritual life and how quickly mm-hmm. we can. Them. And I think whether you're a new convert or a cradle Catholic, whether you're you've been at this for years and years, or or you're still you know a teen, a young teen like you were when you met Saint Francis, you want to know what you need to do to love Jesus, to be a saint, to please Him. And mm-hmm. you think, if only I just, I mean, I've thought, if only I, you know, just had one sentence. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of tattoos uh, per se, but, you know, I could just maybe use a Sharpie on my forearm and just write whatever it was I was supposed to remember. If I could just, if I could, you know, and, and if it was short, I could 
keep it in my head. I wouldn't even need the Sharpie or the tattoo, but I forget it all. Like, and there is Marcel exactly the same. And, and there is Jesus and you get to find out what Jesus is thinking of all of us forgetful little nutters, you know? And what Jesus is saying is like, I'm infinitely patient. I don't mind telling you again that I love you. I don't mind telling you for the hundredth time, you don't need to worry. It's all taken care of. There's the Blessed Mother saying to Marcel, Marcel's worried about cleaning his room and the Blessed Mother says, I'll help you, but there's a room that it's a lot harder to clean. The room of your soul. I'm doing all the work here. You and Therese and Jesus, you little ones are just playing over there and I've got to keep cleaning your soul. And and you know the hardest thing to get rid of, I don't mind, Marcel, I'm glad to do it, but you know the hardest thing to get rid of are these cobwebs, which are all of the worries that you have. Mm. I don't know how to tell you another time, but but I will try. Marcel, don't worry about anything. That's all Therese and Jesus and I want to tell you. Don't worry. We love you. We're going to take you to heaven. You're doing fine. Just don't worry. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they're all telling him this page after page, and I'm saying, thank you, God. Thank you, Jack Keegan, for translating this book for me. And thank you, Liz and me, Devan, for putting it on Amazon. Everybody they have. I just want to read this over and over again because I will read that, and I will put it down, and I will start worrying about the next thing on my to-do list. <laughs> I don't remember it one second longer. <laughs> So, but it's, yeah, it's always there. <laughs> oh, that's, oh, that's understandable. One I think a lot of us can relate to. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, looking at the time, uh, to wrap us up here, if anyone's l- listening to this and saying, you know what, maybe I need to have Marcel Van as a brother. It sounds like he could be really helpful. Where would you have people start? Well, I would say that there are two really fast um, options. Well, no, there's three. Let's go with the very first one. It's beautiful how the Protestant Christians don't waste any time, you know. Just ask Jesus to come into your heart as your Lord and Savior. (laughs) So assuming we've already done that. Um, (laughs) Baptism takes care of it for us as well. Um, With Marcel, I would say the first easiest thing is just to do what he did with St. Therese and ask him to be your brother. He will accept instantly. He's waiting for the opportunity. And I sometimes think we are in on the ground floor with this whole Marcel mania. You know, no one knows about him. Um, you can <laughs> Saint like Padre Pio or St. Therese and they are there. You call on them and they're there. But, I, you know, they're sharing in God's powers and the angels because they're awfully busy. You know, they've got a lot sure. of clients. Whereas Marcel, no one knows about him. So this is the time. You should have seen him. I knew you went. Um, but if you want to learn more, if any of your listeners... Um, have the opportunity to use the internet, and I suppose they would, or they wouldn't have this podcast. I would say that the best place to start for um, anyone who wants to get Mar- to know Marcel better, there's the freeway, and there's <laughs> there's the highway and the little way. <laughs> there's the way that won't cost you anything, and then there's the way that will cost you twenty five dollars. And I recommend them both. Um, but it depends on your circumstances. Of course. I would recommend that readers go, um, they can Google um, my name, S-U-V-I-E-A-N-D-R-E-S, and come up with um, the article I've written on Catholic Exchange, the Marcel Van, The Little Way for Dummies. Mm-hmm. Uh, they can search at Catholic Exchange. Yes. Um, but I would say my website, as you mentioned, suzyandres.com, has a blog called Miss Marcel's Musings. Mm -hmm. And if they can get themselves over there, like you said, the link will be um, at Catholic Exchange. It's in my um, bio on Catholic Exchange as well. If they can get over to Miss Marcel's Musings, um, they will find plenty of blog posts they can read at their leisure with very generous excerpts from Marcel. And that way they can start reading his words. Um, I have to warn everyone, I have a, a relentless sense of humor that I think is funny. Which <laughs> so, <laughs> so do I. We're good. So they, might, they, have to, they might have to skim through a lot of my idea of what's funny to get to Marcel, but he is absolutely there. And that's a place that they could begin to get to know him and see a lot of pictures of him and of the other scenes. Then if a reader... Um, you know, I suppose even 
I can't remember if on the Amazon page, the, the Marcel listings, I can't remember if you can look inside them. Sometimes mm -hmm. you can get a sample and start reading something. Probably if it started from the beginning, you would get these wonderful introductions by Venerable Cardinal Van Thuan, Cardinal Schoenburn, Archbishop Renato, and um, Cardinal Ouellette of Quebec wrote one of the introductions. But you might not be able to get into Marcel himself. If anyone is able to save up their $25 and order a copy of Marcel. Each of his four volumes are only $25 each. And I would most highly recommend Conversations because you dive in anywhere and you just pull out a handful of gems. Um, yes. There's not a bad page in that book. Not in any of them, but the autobiography, I would recommend second. And I would again recommend what I did, which is starting about two-thirds of the way through because he also relates to Therese in the suffering she had as a child. People didn't see her suffering, but her mother had died when she was four, and she went through scruples, and she went through a mysterious illness. And Marcel related to that because his childhood after an initial happiness um, is very sad. So I, I wouldn't say just start from page one and, and go through because I would, I would get too sad. I, later, I went back and read that, and it's well worth reading, but but I'd start, again, about two-thirds of the way through when he meets St. Therese and really call on him, and he will, he will make himself known to you. <laughs> he'll get his books into your hands. He'll, he'll get his picture on your fridge. <laughs> he'll be there when you need him. No, if there's one thing that's always in this podcast is sometimes you find the saints, and a lot of times the saints find you. So, But it can work both ways. And we'll put all those links up yeah. at catholicsexchange.com, of course, so... As I always say, if you're driving, look in the show notes or go to catholicchange.com. You'll be able to get to those sites. But Susie, thank you so much for coming on here. I really love how you and our fellow writer, Mara, Mara have introduced me to Marcel Van, and I love that our readers are going to learn a little bit more. It's a blessing to have you on here today. 